going to start with our, our presentation for lunch with Drew Weston in, in just a minute. I'm going to give, give you an introduction to Drew. Uh, but first, just to say what a wonderful job the last panel did, and Kara managed them well, and they presented beautifully. So uh, this has been a great experience, and I could not agree more about having our minds swimming after the last few days. Um, Drew Weston is um, our speaker. He is a professor in the Department of Psychology and Psychiatry at Emory. Um, his, his field is uh, clinical personality, political psychology. He's a neuroscientist, um, founder of Weston Strategies, which is a strategic messaging firm. He's taught at Harvard and at University of Michigan, and he's written a uh, most recently a book called The Political Brain, and if you uh, go to YouTube, you'll see that his presentations of that subject have uh, been very heavily watched. Um, the, the subtitle is The Role of Emotion in Deciding the Fate of the Nation, and um, it is certainly something that we should pay a lot more attention to, an enormous amount of attention to. It is beyond important that we understand um, and, so, and as conservationists, environmentalists, we've spent a long time rolling the facts out, but what we've realized, and certainly this has been reinforced over the last two days, is that that's not enough. There's so much more. There's power in the, the, the spiritual aspect of nature, the emotion that we, uh, feel, that we all feel when we engage nature and, and on this topic that goes far beyond the science. The science is very much um, an abstraction most of the time, whereas the emotional part is, is, is much more real. The, um, Drew has been on so many, I'm not going to read all of, the, of all of the shows, Anderson Cooper he's been on, uh, Wolf Blitzer, Hardball, Good Morning America, and um, I think his uh, popularity is not only a function of, of his his, his intelligence and the, con and the con contribution he's made to this subject, but also to the desire that we have in this country to understand more about why the decisions we have made are so poor. Why aren't we making better political choices? Why aren't we making b better decisions on policy? And he is someone who can help us understand that from a psychological point of view. Um, he is, I've got more here that I won't go over. Um, he's got his uh, bio is on, um, is on the website, but um, I will introduce you to Drew Weston. And again, thanks to Drew for coming and thank you all again for coming. We'll have one more presentation and then one more panel and we will all leave very much enlightened. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that very warm welcome, and thank you for inviting me here. As a, um, uh, can you hear, all hear me okay? Great. Uh, as, a, um, as a fellow Southerner uh, coming from the state of Georgia, uh, I, um, um, I feel your pain on environmental issues. Uh, we're, um, we in Georgia are not exactly the, uh, the most enlightened state on conservation and environmental issues. Um, and, uh, but um, it's a, you know, it's obviously a, a problem that has been enormous that our country should have taken leadership on and has not done so either. And uh, so I'm going to be talking about that and about why, why that is and what we can do to change it. I, I'll, I'll tell you at the beginning that I'm delighted that the, um, the World Bank has just taken an interest in this, in climate change in particular. Um, their, uh, their president, Jim Kim, uh, is convinced that this is the, um, the major issue of our times and is devoting resources to it. And I'm actually about to begin a, a messaging project with them, thinking in the U.S. but also internationally about how to talk about these, uh, talk about these issues. But I'll be, I'll be talking a good bit about, about the message, about um, what we might call sustainable messages that can help people change, help us change minds on energy, conservation, and climate. 
I, I, am a, I am a psychologist and neuroscientist by training, so I can't stop myself from beginning with an experiment. You are all the subjects. Uh, so if you would uh, take out your imaginary consent forms, thank you very much for signing those. I appreciate that. Uh, what I'd like you to do is to memorize the following pairs of words. Are you ready? Okay. Ocean, moon, floor, chair, glasses, tea. You have those pairs of words memorized? Okay, now, what I'd like you to do is, when I raise my hand, I just want you to all really do this, just shout out the name of the first vegetable that comes to your mind. Okay, you ready? Okay, no consensus. This is probably a progressive leaning audience. All right, so um, I, I, often do that with, I often do that with Democrats just to make sure there's, there's all Democrats in a room because you can do that by getting them to say no, they have no agreement on anything. So um, now what I'd like you to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise my hand, but wait till my hand goes up, and I want you just to say the name of the first laundry detergent that comes to your mind. You ready? How many of you said Todd? How many of you said something else? Okay, there's a, there are two neurologists outside who are waiting to speak with you. In a room like this, I could typically get somewhere between, uh, between 80 and 100% of people to say Tide. Now, the market share of Tide is about 40%, which means I should be working, working for Procter & Gamble. Uh, uh, but uh, it's actually more lucrative than working for environmental organizations, but we all have our values. Um, the, um, now, one, one principle of messaging that I actually am just going to make now is that um, you'll notice that I said the market share of Tide is about 40%. I did not say the market share of Tide is 41.23%. We, on our side of this issue, like to do that on these issues, you know, environmental issues. Environmentalists are some of the worst at this. And I say this as a fellow environmentalist, is that we love to give precision. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of that. The problem is that as soon as you give those percentages, first of all, I could tell you as a scientist uh, that the precision after the decimal point, unless you're a physicist, is all error. All right? So if you can say about 40%, and then I say, and, but I can get about 80% of people to say it, that's telling you immediately you're making the inference, huh, he's doubled the market share. I wonder how he did that. Right? If I say 41.23%, you're thinking 41.23, is it really that high? Is it maybe 41.7 or is it you know, 36.3? That's not where you want people. You don't want them in the weeds. Uh, so, and we put people in the weeds all the time. The, the, our, our opponents on environmental issues, on conservation issues, always stay at the level of values. They are always at 10, 000, flying at 10,000 feet while we're in the weeds. And the, the goal of good messaging is to fly at 10,000 feet with values, because that's where people live. I mean, we, we, I, I was delighted to hear, um, uh, I just, just flew in a little while ago, but I was delighted to hear the last piece of that last panel, and to hear the word stewardship. As a fellow, again, as a fellow Southerner, I'm constantly saying to, to elected officials, to advocates, talk about, talk with Southerners, talk with evangelicals, talk with, you know, talk with people all over the country about this issue of stewardship of the earth because it's something that people understand and anyone who's gone to church on Sunday certainly understands it and it's something that people who are Jewish people understand it people get it um, so anyway how was it how was it that I got so many of you to say Ty if we were to do a little focus group we I demonstrate that that why focus groups can be useless I, I use them. I just came from several straight days of focus groups for, a, for another project. I'm trying to figure out how to, how to, uh, uh, how to help uh, particularly um, white swing voters um, uh, get on board with, with um, trying to do something about the problem facing, problems facing young men of color in this country. So um, I do focus groups, but I do them with a, I do them with a jaundiced uh, a jaundiced ear and a jaundiced eye. And the reason is that because what you often do in focus groups is you ask people conscious questions about unconscious processes. Let me, give you, let me show you what I mean. 
The reason why most of you said Tide, some of you would say, if I asked you, why did you say Tide? You'd say, oh, I don't know, it just sort of came to mind. Some of you would say, I think I use it at home. Some of you would say, I don't know, I pictured that orange, you know, that orange uh, uh, non-biodegradable bottle. Uh, some, some of you would say plastic. Some of you would say, um, uh, I think my mom used it when I was a kid. 40% of you are right, because that's the market share of Tide. The other 40% of you are wrong. The reason why you said Tide is because I primed you with the words ocean moon. And that activated what neuroscientists call a network of association. That is an interconnected set of thoughts and feelings and ideas and images, values, and as we'll see, emotions, that if you simply connect those things up, what ends up happening is um, you activate those unconsciously. So that I said ocean moon, but I never said waves or tide. But waves and tide were activated now at a higher state of latent activation unconsciously. Uh, so what that means is, when I then said laundry detergents, all fab, cheer, tide, all got activated as well. It's all unconscious. Uh, but you'll notice that there's only one point of intersection between those two networks. And that point of intersection is tide. And that's why it's most likely to come to conscious and why I should be working for Procter & Gamble. Now, the scary thing about this is, once you know this, you understand that your, your job is to activate and deactivate networks. That's your job. And when you're trying to get people to think about, you use a word like conservation. You use a word like, as we'll see, global warming. I'm going to talk about the networks that that activates and why global warming is a term that you should never take out of this room again. Uh, the, the, um, uh, are, you okay, are you guys OK with a risque example of how networks work? Or should I not do that? Risque is OK? Uh, I should look. Uh, all right. This is uh, the network's active at, uh, active at Fox. JLo's new song, Jenny from the Block, all about Lopez roots, about how she's still a neighborhood gal at heart. But folks from that street in New York, the Bronx section, sound more likely to give her a curb job than a blow job or blo block party. The New York Post, which, sorry about that slip up there. I have no idea how that happened, but it won't happen again. And that's your news and the G Block, as Fox reports this Monday, November. All right, so, first of all, I have to say it couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. I, although, although he is really the voice of reason at Fox these days, which is kind of scary. But anyway, uh, the, um, I actually just gave you in this one slide all the principles to understand what happened. Uh, what happened was this, is that, and, and, and uh, this is actually kind of scary for a public speaker. I want to tell you don't think of this the next time you're doing public speaking, but if I do that, it actually, actually activates an unconscious process that starts you looking for stuff like this which then diverts your attention. So don't not think about this the next time you're giving a public speech. But as I'm speaking now, and I, I, come from, I come from Georgia, I talk pretty fast for Georgia. But think about what I'm saying now. I cannot possibly be conscious of the words that are coming out of my mouth at this rate. I mean, it's, I, I mean, I have to, I mean think about it. if you were actually giving a talk and stopping and thinking about every word. I would be speaking like this. That doesn't happen. Well, why doesn't it happen? Because most of this is going on unconsciously. If you're male, it's going on in your left hemisphere. If you're female, you're likely to have some right hemisphere involvement as well. Uh, by the way, for any of you who have wondered why it is that Gabby Giffords is able to use language again, it's because she's female. If Gabby Giffords had been male, uh, she, would never, she would, wouldn't be able to comprehend a sentence. It's also, by the way, it's just an interesting little fact. It's also, by the way, for those of you who have had kids or grandkids uh, with learning disabilities and they are more likely to be boys, that's why. It's because, because uh, females recruit more of the right hemisphere, so they've got more of their brain working on it. Um, in any case, the point I'm making, what I was going to make is that what's happening is that when Shepard Smith was trying to say block party, there's this, all this, this firing going back among circuits in his left hemisphere. And his brain was activating, he wanted to say block, his brain was activating high frequency words in the English language that begin with BLO. 
but apparently some second network got activated. <laughs> that uh, that uh, told us a little more about what was on Shepard Smith's mind than we really wanted to know. All right, now why, why do I use this example? Because networks are absolutely central to messaging. If you understand what you're activating, you understand what you're not activating, you understand what you want to deactivate, it makes all the difference in the world. So let me give you some examples. The unemployed. It's a term we hear used all the time. You should never use a phrase like this. When I talk to members of Congress, I say all the time, if it starts with the blank and a group, never use it. All we use, always start with people who, as in people who've lost their jobs. Why? Because when you say the unemployed, you turn real people with pain-lined faces and stressful lives into an abstraction instead of doing it the other way around, which is what you really want to do. And this is, you're going to see this is exactly the same thing you want to do on conservation issues, environmental issues more generally, climate issues, is you've got to turn an abstraction into something that people can actually picture, that they can actually see, that they can actually feel. Because if you don't do that, you're not going to move them. Um, it turns out that actually in the brain, that when you say the unemployed, you activate a part of the brain up here that is so far from the emotion circuits in the brain that you might as well just not bother. When you say people who, you actually activate circuits up here that are directly connected with emotion circuits. You activate completely different circuits by saying people who. You're now activating human circuits, and those are the circuits that you want to activate. Entitlement programs. Every time I hear a, a, a politician use this term, I want to strangle them. Uh, you know, I, I, my, my home discipline is psychology and psychiatry. One of the criteria for narcissistic personality disorder is a sense of entitlement. What does entitlement mean? Think about the associations you have to entitlement. Entitlement means you want a handout. Entitlement wants, means you believe you're entitled to something that you don't deserve, or that you're entitled to something because you just think you ought to have it. That's why a different way to talk about it is insurance we pay for through our taxes. Well, now what you do when you say insurance, what kind of people take out insurance policies for their families? Responsible people. What kind of people want hands out, handouts? Irresponsible people. You've activated a completely different network when you say entitlement programs versus insurance we pay for through taxes. You're actually now actually making taxes a good thing. Because now you're taking out an insurance policy with the most powerful, the most powerful organization in the world, and that is the United States government, federal government. So, uh, interestingly, FDR, when he introduced his his uh, his programs, he introduced them. He called them social insurance. He understood intuitively. He understood that this was a form of insurance. And talking about it that way was very, very different from any way anyone had ever, I mean, no one had ever dreamed of the kind of policies that he put in place and that are getting rapidly destroyed. Now, global warming. Why is that a bad phrase? Well, it's a bad phrase for a lot of reasons. First of all, first time I heard it, I used to live in Boston. First time I heard it, I remember thinking, well, that sounds kind of good. I mean, you live in Boston? Global warming sounds like a great idea. I mean, I, I, my first thought was Memorial Day. Maybe, you know, if I'm on the Cape, I could actually stick my feet in the water. I mean, that's what came to my mind when I heard global warming. The other thing about global warming is it implicitly suggests that things go like this. That it's a linear process where it gets hotter and hotter as opposed to like this. Now, we all know uh, uh, something about how that process works. We also know how it can be that you can get a you can get a massive uh, a massive spell of of, uh, of snow that's caused by global global warming. We all you know, we understand that, but for the average person, intuitively, that makes no sense at all. I mean, you have to explain about how precipitation gets into the air and how it freezes and and why there's why there's more precipitation in the air because it was warmer at a time when it shouldn't have been, but. None of, that, none of that makes any sense to the average person. I remember sitting a couple years ago um, at a, um, 
at a, uh, in, in Florida at spring break with my kids. And uh, there was this guy sitting over, it was chilly, and the kids for some reason like to get in cold water. I don't understand it, but, but they do. And all the parents were shivering in their towels, you know, and the kids were in the water saying, you know, come on in, Daddy, come on in, Daddy, you know, it's all, all of that. Uh, and the, um, there was this guy sitting a couple tables over from me, and he says, um, he's talking about the weather, he says, huh, wonder what all, old Al Gore would say about this. And I was thinking to myself, he'd say you're a moron. <laughs> now, I didn't say that because he looked like he'd played football at one point, and I figured it's probably not the smartest thing to do. Uh, but uh, the reason he said that was because it looked to him like there was no global warming. This was April 1st in the Gulf of, you know, in the, in the Gulf, and it should have been warm. And last year it was warm. So how could there be global warming? Words that work better. Climate change has become more accepted over time. Uh, I actually heard that word used without a caveat for the first time on the NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams in March. I have never before heard Brian Williams ever or any other um, uh, network news uh, newscaster ever say climate change without adding in caveats about how scientists disagree. This time he just said it. It was, it, was, it, was, it was music to my ears. Uh, but climate change is not terribly strong to people. Here's one that uh, has organically started to emerge, and that is extreme weather. It's one that people have started to use naturally, uh, and I think is, is a great term that's going to be really helpful to us because people can see it with their own eyes. And I cannot emphasize enough in messaging, the more you can connect with people's eyes, the more, the better you're doing. The more you can activate the circuits in people's brains that have them picturing something, the more, uh, the more you're, you're likely to activate the emotions that make them actually move. And emotions, as we'll see in a second, are what move people. Pollution. Here's a term that's incredibly powerful. Everyone knows what pollution is. Everyone that is except for environmental advocates, and, um, who I have to say are some of the brightest people I know and also do some of the worst messaging. And the reason, one of the reasons why the messaging is often so bad is because environmental advocates like to be really precise. I remember once presenting some data on, on, um, on climate change messages that were winning with the general public over a really tough all of the above opposition message by 40 points. And I, I thought they, that people would be really pleased by that. And in fact, about 90% of the people in the room were. Then there was that other 10% who had these looks on their faces like this. Well, what's that going? What's going on about that? Well, they start to raise their hands. They say, well, you called that pollution. I said, yeah. Well, it's not pollution. It's carbon emissions. I said, well, I'm a simple man. Seems to me that carbon emissions are kind of a form of pollution, aren't they? Yeah, but if they're carbon emissions, they're different. Okay, I said, well, let me go, it went to a different level. I said, well, um, let me try a different way. I'm, a, I'm a, a, a psychologist, a neuroscientist. I know something about cognitive neuroscience. And the way our brains are organized is that we have these superordinate categories like pollution. And then down below them, you got carbon emissions, you got, you got um, other kinds of pollution, you know, different types. Is that, is that accurate? So yeah. So, so is it okay to call it pollution then? Because p everyone knows that in the 1960s and 70s, we took on pollution, and our and many of our parents' generation took on pollution, and it, and they were successful at it, uh, in many ways, not in all, but in many. And people get that. So, it's not pollution. So uh, I learned the next. I gave the same speech the next day in um, in uh, out in San Francisco. And I had learned my lesson. And what I did was, this time, I began by saying, I want to start by telling you that I'm a scientist. Uh, my, my background is in, is, is in, is in, is in um, cognitive, clinical, personality, psychology, and neuroscience. I have three grants from the National Institutes of Mental Health currently. I analyze my own data. I believe in numbers. Um, uh, I'm happy to analyze data together with you. And I'm here to tell you that the best available scientific evidence demonstrates 
that the best way to lose on climate change is to present people with the best available scientific evidence. And everybody laughed and they got it. And what I had just done were two things. One was I connected with my audience in a way that I'm going to talk with you about in a second, which, is, which we often don't do. We skip that step of making sure we first make a connection with the audience. If you don't first connect with people so that they identify with you, so that they say, oh, this is a person like me, uh, then you lose them. You're not going to get them. If they don't see that you're a person who shares their values, they're not with you. But the other thing that I did was I simply, I, I, I got across the idea that we should be using the same kind of science to determine how we speak to the public as we use to determine what are the best solutions to climate change. What are the best solutions to our energy problems? Science, we need to use science to do that. And that doesn't mean that we sort of, you know, it, it doesn't mean, that, by the way, that we don't have to tell the truth. One of the things that I always, I always tell clients is, the one thing I won't do is, I will not say anything that's not true. And part of your job with your scientists on board um, is to help me get the messages right, but I'm not gonna be as precise as you want me to be. Because if I'm that precise, we'll lose the public. And the public doesn't need to know that level of precision. You know, it's amazing how if you give people just enough information about what a proposed solution is, if you're an expert, they assume, well, this person's the expert. He or she knows what to do about it. I'll leave that to them, but I'm hopeful now. That's what you have to instill. You have to instill that hope. So three principles of, of effective messaging, and then I'm going to show you how they work in energy and climate. Tell a coherent, memorable story. We are a, um, we're a species that's a storytelling species. We've been around as homo sapiens for about 100 years, 100,000 years. Now, if I were doing this in, in progressive speak, I would say, of course, scientists debate whether homo sapiens have really been around for 100,000 or 150. It really depends on the carbon dating procedure you use. Not necessary. All right, it's been about 100,000 years. Get that word about into your, into your vocabulary. Once you say roughly or about, then let the other side get in the weeds. Let them say, no, it's not. It's been 124,000 year, years. And that puts you in the position of being able to say, you know what, whether it's been 100 or whether it's been 150, we are now changing the face of our climate in a way that is a serious problem for the next 100,000 years or the next 124,000 if you want to be that precise. And now they're the ones who look like the morons and we're the ones who look like we're at flying at 10,000 feet with those values because we're the ones who care about stewardship of the earth and they're the ones who don't. Uh, so we're a storytelling species. There's a reason that, that by the age of four or five, ever try to tell a story to a kid that didn't have a particular structure to it? which begins with, you know, it begins with there's an introduction that sets up the characters in this initial situation. And then there's some kind of hill to be climbed or battle to be fought. And then there's a denouement where things start to, get, start to get resolved. And then there's a resolution at the end, whether it's a tragedy or whether it's a hopeful story. Try telling, try telling your kids or grandkids or your nieces or your nephews a story that doesn't have that structure. In every culture in the world, that same structure emerges in kids' minds starting around age four or five, and by the time they're eight, they tell stories, eight, 10, they start telling stories of that structure. Well, that's because our brains were built that way because we had to have a way of transmitting values and, uh, and knowledge across generations for 100,000 years before the rise of liter literacy. Because it wasn't until 5,000 years ago that literacy emerged among humans. So how did we transmit knowledge? Think about, uh, you know, we just came from a panel on spirituality. Think about the, about the great monotheistic religions that emerged over the last several thousand years in that time lit since literacy emerged. You think about Judaism, you think about, about Christianity, you think about Islam. How are, there, how are there holy books written? They're written in the form of parables. Why are they written in the form of parables? Because stories stick in people's minds. So that... Uh, you want to get a story across, um, you want to get a message across, get a story across. The way to do that in political narratives, or in narratives about issues like this, which are political or quasi-political. Quasi you know, the issue of climate shouldn't be a political issue. I mean, it should be, a, it should be a, a human issue. It should be an American issue. It should be a, an issue we all care about. But you start by, by connecting with your audience. 
if you are introduced on television, for example, as an environmentalist, you already have a hill, hill to be climbed, right? So what you do is you simply redefine yourself. You say, yeah, you know what I care about is the water that we drink and the, uh, and the, and the, the earth that we leave our children. Now suddenly you've gone from being an environmentalist, one of them, to being one of us. Everybody cares about, about the water we drink and the air we breathe and the earth we leave our children. You've now redefined yourself. I wrote, a, I wrote an article um, uh, back in, in the New York Times about, about, a, about a year and a half ago that was very critical of the Obama administration. The, the um, administration was not terribly happy with me. Uh, they were not terribly happy with the New York Times for publishing it either. Um, and the, um, uh, they sent out some talking points to be used on all the NPR shows, all the others and stuff. I, and I, 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 I knew it from a friend, um, but I also started getting ambushed with these things every time I was on a show. So I kept getting introduced as, you know, liberal psychologist and academic Drew Weston had this critique of the, you know, that's how they started out. And I just started, I would just diffuse it by saying, you know, I don't know whether you want to call me a liberal, a conservative, a moderate, but my point is simply that, that hardworking people ought to, ought, shouldn't be losing their jobs and their income shouldn't be lower than it was 30 years ago. If that makes me a liberal, that makes me a liberal. If that makes me a conservative going back to 30 years ago, that makes me a conservative. Well, that just defused it completely. I turned off that, ne that liberal network, which is connected with all kinds of things like big government and tax and spend and you know, sushi, sushi eating, latte drinking, godless atheists, which in this part of the country doesn't go over so well. Uh, you know, Massachusetts people go, oh, that sounds good to me. I'm, you know, I I'm ready to vote for you. So the second thing you do after you connect, that's when you raise the concerns. That's when you, that's when you can tell people all the nasty stuff you want to tell them about what's happening and why we need to do something about it and who's doing it. That's when you introduce the antagonists in your story if you need to introduce antagonists. Once you've done that, you always want to end with hope because what you've done is, by, with this structure, you start out by connecting with people, creating positive feeling towards you and what you're saying. You move into what people ought to be concerned and anxious or angry about, but you don't ever want to leave people with anger or, 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 or anxiety. You want to leave them with hope that something can be done. If you leave men with anxiety, they get mad at you because men don't like to be anxious. Leave, with, leave women with anxiety and, um, and they, tur they turn you off because um, they don't like to be anxious either. Men just get angry when they get anxious. I mean, any of you who are married to a man know that. Uh, you know, make him anxious and before you know it, he'll be angry because anger is much more comfortable for, for men. Women just start to turn it off after a while. And again, I'm making global general, generalizations, uh, but um, we're talking overlapping bell curves here. Anyway, so anyway, end with hope. Second principle, if you don't feel it, don't use it. This is the, the Ella Fitzgerald, uh, Duke Ellington principle of, of messaging, which is it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. We are, um, human behavior is motivated by emotion. If you do not have emotion behind an issue, you will not win on that issue. And I can tell you, I study, uh, I do a lot of message testing. If I don't see that f at least 40% of people gave a message on a 100, po 100, to 100 point scale, zero to 100, if I don't see that at least 40 gave it an 80 to 100, I know that, that that message is not going to win because it's low emotional intensity. And that's the biggest problem with climate messages, is that we can get 63% of the public saying that, yes, I believe that climate change is happening. But we can only typically get 23, 24, 25% say, yeah, I think we really ought to do something about this with an 80 to 100. And that's the emotion factor. That's one of the major reasons we lose on this issue all the time. It's one of the main reasons no one really cared much except advocates about Kyoto. Uh, that, that's how that happened. And I'll tell you, if the average person doesn't care about Kyoto, then the people who are making those treaties don't care much about, about Kyoto because they're thinking about their next election. Um, let me give you an example. This is, this is Al Gore talking about Medicare in his first debate with George W. Bush. Now, I watched this, and I, I have to say, I mean, I'm going to give a totally nonpartisan 
talk here. This is a C3 organization, I presume, so I'll, I'll be nonpartisan. But I will, you know, forewarned is forearmed. I am, I am a progressive Democrat, especially for a Southerner. That makes me, I mean, anything, anything, anything right of, of, of who knows, anything left of whatever is, is, a, is a progressive Democrat if you're a Southerner. But um, this, is, this is Democratic messaging at its absolute worst. And when I saw this, I thought, oh my God, another Democrat's going to lose an unlosable election. Um, Bob Shrum, who was, who was, who was the, debate, uh, uh, the debate advisor for Al Gore, was in the back. When he heard this, he went, yes, he nailed it. And that's, Bob Shrum has actually had the, had the, um, uh, the what would you say, the privilege of working for every Democratic presidential candidate except for, uh, in the last 50 years, except for Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, and Jimmy Carter. <laughs> but he kept getting picked as, you know, like the guru of how to do this stuff. Anyway, here's Al Gore on Medicare talking about, about Governor Bush's plan. Under the governor's plan, if you kept the same fee for service that you have now under Medicare, your premiums would go up by between 18 and 47 percent, and that's the study of the congressional plan that he's uh, modeled his proposal on by the Medicare actuaries. All right, now what's wrong with that message? Pretty much everything. First of all, uh, most people don't know what fee for service is, right? so that's a problem. 18 to 48 percent. Are any of you going to remember those numbers? No. Uh, in fact, it took me about 80 times of, of showing that clip before I remember that it wasn't 17 to 48 or 8. To, I don't. I've now already forgotten what those numbers are. Third, the average person doesn't know what an actuary is, and they probably wouldn't like one if they did. Right, so, uh, my apologies to any actuaries in the room. Um, it's one who's helped me a lot with my pension, so pension plan, so I can't complain. But the, the point is that people don't know what you're talking about when you talk about Medicare actuaries. And a prime principle of messaging is don't make people feel stupid. It's not a good idea. People don't tend to listen to you much when you make them feel stupid. Now imagine if he'd said this. You know, under the governor's plan, your rates are going to go up by about a third. Now if you're on a fixed income, that's an awful lot of money. And we don't do that to our parents and grandparents in this country. I just said the same thing he said. For those of you who are, who are really mathematically inclined, 18 to 48 percent, take the middle of that, it's about a third. But when I said about a third, I could put the intonation in my voice that said, I mean this, I care about this, it matters to me. In his inconvenient campaign, Al Gore never did that. In an inconvenient truth, he did. The difference is he was coached by different people. He was coached by Hollywood producers and directors who understood that you tell a story and you tell it with emotion because that's what moves people. And I remember I only watched that movie once. And I have to tell you, it changed my behavior. This sounds small, but if we all did it, it would make a huge difference. I go around my house turning off lights all the time, and I've done it since the evening that I saw An Inconvenient Truth. I never did it before that, never. It didn't occur to me that it made a difference. And it occurred to me that it made a difference after that. And I'm on my daughters about it all the time, right? And uh, so that's the kind of thing that, but it was because I remember some of the words that Al Gore used. I remember them to this day, and it was a decade ago, I think, that I, that I saw that movie. I want to show you an example of good. I told you, showed you, you know, that was, this is like the, uh, Gore, I, I wish I could show you more of these. This is like, Gore on Medicare is like part of the hit parade of terrible democratic messaging or messaging on the left. The right tends to be much better on messaging, and the reason for that is they actually spend money on it. The, if you compare the budgets of the think tanks on the right versus the budgets of the think tanks on the left, and this is true of corporate budgets in the energy industry, versus budgets of the environmental, environmental organizations. Uh, but let's stick, with, let's stick with think tanks on the right versus the left. Heritage Foundation, American Enterprise Institute, Cato. They put about half, the, half their non-administrative costs into thinking, into paying people to think great conservative thoughts. 
they put the other half into marketing. How do you market those great conservative thoughts? Progressive organizations, think tanks on the left, they put about 98% of their non-administrative costs into thinking great policies, great progressive policies, and then they hire a 23-year-old communications director with no background uh, and who, who, you know, maybe had a communications degree, maybe didn't, and that's their communications department. That's their marketing. Well, why do you think the environmental movement's gotten killed for years? Now, this is changing. It's good to see that it's changing. But it's environmental movement. It's the fact that, 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 that progressive and democratic policymakers use the words entitlement tells us just how bad the messaging infrastructure is on the left as opposed to the right. The right would never do that. I mean, the, I mean people at Heritage are laughing, laughing, them, la laughing their butts off every time you see a debate on Meet the Press where both sides are talking about entitlement cuts <laughs> because they're thinking you're using all the words that activates our net, activate our networks. Thank you. We appreciate that. We want people to see these as handouts because if they see them as handouts, they'll cut them, even though they may be handouts to their own parents or to themselves, which they actually earned, like Social Security. I don't know about you, but I see this little thing that comes out of my paycheck from memory every, every month, and that's for Social Security. Well, I put that in there. That is insurance that I earn through my taxes. I want to show you one good example, though, from, 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 from the left. This is Jim Webb's response to the State of the Union address in 2006 by George W. Bush. It is the only time I can ever remember a State of the Union address being eclipsed by the 10-minute response to it. The only other time I've ever seen that someone come near to that was Bobby Jindal about three years ago, but not in quite the same way. Now, this is Jim Webb. He'd been a senator for about two weeks, maybe th almost three at this point. When I graduated from college, the average corporate CEO made 20 times what the average worker did. Today, it's nearly 400 times. In other words, it takes the average worker more than a year to make the money that his or her boss makes in one day. Now, isn't that powerful? He used nothing but numbers, but look at how differently he used them than Al Gore. What he, and that, I don't mean to Al Gore bash, I, I love so many things he's done. The man was right about everything except about how to get elected. But uh, the, the worst selected, whichever the case, the case may be. But um, the, um, uh, what Jim Webb did with those numbers was he activated two things. One was a value, and that is fairness. And that's a value that's been demonstrated empirically by Jonathan, Jonathan Haidt, if you follow his work, another, uh, another fellow psychologist, buddy of mine. Uh, that's, a, that's a value that's shared across the political spectrum, It's a value of fairness. He also activated a moral emotion, which is righteous indignation. How can it possibly be that your boss deserves more in one, one day than you make in an entire year doing what you do? Can that possibly be fair under anybody's definition of fairness? No. And by prefacing it by saying, you know, when I was in college, it was the average CEO made 20 times. Now it's 400 times. That gives you, it essentially sets up the contrast so you can see that it's changed. Because otherwise people think, well, 20 times, 400 times, I don't know what a CEO ought to get. But when it's 20 times, you know, back in the days when there was a good healthy middle class, and it's 400 times now in the days when people are just barely hanging on to the middle class if they can with their fingernails, then people get it. My point is not that we don't have to dumb down our messages. My point is that we need to increase their emotional intelligence. And that was an incredibly emotional, emotionally intelligent question, uh, emotionally intelligent um, uh, um, response to say union address. Now you might ask, how is it that someone who is a Democrat uh, and uh, left of center was able within three weeks of joining the Senate to be able to give an emotionally intelligent message. It's because he used to be a Republican. All right, so um, the last couple of points I'll make about, about messaging on, about emotion. One is positive and negative emotions are not the opposite. And this is something that, that those of you who, are, who tend to the left on, on, on issues, and I know that there's a, there's a wide spectrum of people in here. Uh, there are plenty of people who, are, who consider themselves moderate or conservative, uh, who care a lot about, about environmental issues, who care a lot about conservation. 
Uh, but this has been an issue that's been championed more by the left. But one of the mistakes that people on the left make is that they don't like to use negative. They don't like negative emotions. It's like, well, anxiety and anger are bad things to make people feel. Well, sometimes that's true, sometimes that's not. Um, and um, actually, we'll do another little experiment. This time I won't, I won't ask for a show of hands. Well, actually, I'll ask for a show of hands on one thing. One thing. How many of you are in a long-term relationship? Marriage, partnership, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. Okay, it's most of you. Now we have a, so a dating specialist in the back of the rest. Uh, the, the, um, uh, of those of you who had your hand up, I won't ask you to, you to, um, uh, to, to raise your hands on this, but um, you, know, think, you can think to yourself. How many of you would say that you love your spouse or partner or whoever it is? Probably most, right? All right, all right. We even, have, we even have some people raising their hands. All right. Now, think about in the last six, eight weeks. Who has pissed you off more than anybody else in the world? <laughs> it's probably the same person, isn't it? Unless you have a teenager. All right. So, what does that mean? <laughs> what that means is that it turns out that the circuits for positive and negative emotions in our brains are virtually entirely independent. There are some arousal circuits that just are just, you know, how emotionally aroused are you that are shared. After that, they go off in different directions. There is nothing about the way our brains work that make, means that we feel, that if we feel positive about something, we therefore don't feel negative about it. And understanding ambivalence is absolutely key to understanding messaging. Understanding that we have mixed feelings about things. Uh, uh, climate change is a great example. Anything that would require us to change that could involve effort on our part, that could involve money on our part, no matter how valuable we think it is, evokes ambig amb ambivalence. And you've got to figure out how to deal with that ambivalence. Um, so finally, third principle of messaging, know what networks you're activating, and I've already been through that. So the three principles. One, tell a coherent, memorable story. Two, if you don't feel it, don't use it. Emotion is key. And third, know what, know what networks you're activating. I'm going to wrap up with just some examples. First, mention a methodology for developing effective messages, and then some examples of messages that actually work on energy, conservation, and climate. And then I'll give you one caveat to conclude. So the first thing that I've already mentioned is the same scientific methods that apply to policy should apply to our communication strategies. We should be testing messages. You should never go out in public with a message that you haven't tested. This is one of the biggest mistakes made by the left. It is never made by the right. I promise you, you will never see anyone get on Meet the Press who is a senator, a Republican senator, who has not been prepped thoroughly with messages that have already been tested probably that week. You will almost never see someone on the left who's prepared that way. And it's a, it's a huge difference, and you see it really, really easily. Actually, I remember, if you don't mind, a, a, an anecdote about this. I remember watching, a, uh, there was a Democratic congressman and a Republican congresswoman um, talking about the question. They were on, 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 on CNN. They were asked, um, the question, big question posed was, um, uh, are Democrats going to raise your taxes? Now, first of all, no Republican would ever appear on a show that says, are Republicans gonna, gonna cut your benefits? They'd say, no, I'm not gonna be on that show. You gotta retitle that, you gotta make that neutral. Democrat didn't do that. That's not, that's not good prep work up front. All right, but aside from that, the, um, the Democrat gets on, he's asked that question, he says, well, you see, it really, and he's, he's going like this and this with his hands. You know, this is gonna go up and this subsidy's gonna go down and, and, and it was, all really good in the weeds policy. And I looked at his face and I watched his nonverbals. I kind of liked the guy. But all I remember was this. This is all I can remember to this day. But I remember exactly what the Republican, this woman congressman gets on. She says, you know the difference between him and me? He sees this as revenue. I see this as your paycheck. I listened to that and I thought, I'm voting for her. Because she understood that this is, this is money that I earn and I want to see it spent well. Now, I'm happy to see it spent well. That's why I'm, I'm left to center. I'm happy to see it spelt, spent well 
whether it's by government, whether it's by business, whether it's by government, uh, by, by public-private partnerships, which Americans adore public-private pu private partnerships. And they tend to work very well a lot of the time. So I'm not anti-business, I'm not anti-government, I'm for what works. Um, but you know, as soon as I heard her say, you know, I see this is your paycheck, I understood the values behind it, that she was caring about my paycheck, and he was just seeing this as this and this. All right, polling versus message testing, key difference, and one that, again, the right understands really well, the left doesn't, and this, and this has been true on environmental issues. And that is that polling is this. Which way is the wind blowing? One of the most destructive things that, that um, Democratic elected officials do is they send out their pollsters to find out where, the, where their constituents are right now. Well, where their constituents are right now is usually where the Heritage Foundation's left them, because the Heritage Foundation's done their work, and they've done messaging research to figure out how do you move people to a particular place. So Heritage gets out there, and they say, here's how you talk about it. And then the, then the poll, Democratic pollsters go, where are people? Ooh, they don't seem to like climate change very much. They don't think we should do anything about it. I better not run on that issue. As opposed to, well, why don't we figure out how we talk about climate in a way that actually moves people? That's messaging research, as opposed to polling. You study the existing polls to understand the networks. You design messages, refine them in focus groups if useful. You do survey and dial test messages online using large samples, always test them against strong opposition messages. When I say dial test messages, I'm gonna show you some messages that I refined over a couple of iterations where I had, a, you know, have you seen these dial tests where you'll see Frank Luntz or, it used to be Frank Luntz, he's no longer on CNN doing this, but you'll see there'll, there'll be 30 people in CNN uh, uh, who are in a focus group and they got a little dial, they're moving this way as they listen to a speech or presidential address or a debate, like, they move it this way if they don't like it, this way if they do. What we see at the bottom of the screen is this, you know, is, is how are, how's that average, what's the average of those people? Well, I do those with a thousand people at a time, but I do them online. And that way I can see the really small nuances of what's moving people. I get a representative sample that way. Uh, but what I, the way people do that online is they move a slider with their mouse this way if they like what they're hearing as they're listening to a message and they move it this way if they don't. What I see is something that looks like this. And having seen this now on about 80,000 people, testing about, oh, I don't know, at this point probably close to a million messages on, uh, on 20, 25 different issues. I can tell you most of the time which is the way the dials are gonna work. But I'll tell you, the best, the best cure for narcissism is empiricism, is that I am wrong about 25% of the time. And that's why I do those dial tests every time. And sometimes I'll just see that there's a word, and I'll go, huh, green. For some reason, that's going flat, and it's going slightly down with men. Why is it going down with men? Green is not a masculine color. I hope there's not any men um, in Fendi who are wearing green right now. But, uh, I'm wearing blue, which is plenty masculine. Uh, but um, uh, puts, put, actually putting on this shirt put some hair on my chest this morning. But, but the, the, the point of it is that you can see these fine nuances. I'll actually give, give you an example. One of these is um, uh, I was doing some work on, on, um, on civil unions and uh, gay marriage about five, six years ago. This is before anyone had any idea that this issue was gonna, was gonna be the one progressive issue that actually has, has gone up at the polls and has, where public opinion is shifting rapidly uh, in a way that no one, no one could have predicted. Um, the, the, although there were, there were a few people who predicted it, and there's some people who did some really hard work to make that happen, like screenwriters who all agreed, television screenwriters who all agreed that they would not, they would not write for a show that did not have a gay character portrayed positively. And that has made all the difference because it brought, it's, it's brought gay people into everyone's living room, whether they're right, left, or center. Anyway, the point of all this was I, was I was using some fairly standard language in a couple of messages about, you know, people, about, um, it, about the person who matters to you the most being able to be by your side in the hospital. Okay, so I, I had some language about, you know, in the hospital by your bedside. And I'm watching the dials and they're going up and up and up. And then there's this, dip at the end. Well, that's kind of strange. I wonder what it was that did that. And I thought, wait a minute. 
and I stratified by males and females. And I broke it down now instead of to look at how did males respond, how did females respond? Well, females went straight up, males went like this. And what I realized was that by using the word the words bed and gay in close proximity to each other. I had activated a network that, that uh, activists on this issue call the ick factor, uh, which is that men find the thought of other men, of, of, straight men find the thought of, 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 of gay male activities icky. Right? And, uh, and that caused a difference. So the next time I tried the message, I said, uh, they ought to be able to be by their sides at the hospital or in their hospital rooms. Dials went straight up. And you're going to see some messages in a moment on environmental issues uh, where the dials went straight up. Uh, last thing I'll just mention uh, is that you always want to test these messages against the strongest opposition messages you can get. I always, use, I always use messages from BP or from the oil industry because the oil industry has these beautiful messages. That, I mean, if you've you seen that, that, well, they, BP did this a lot more before they spilled 200 million gallons of of oil into the, into the Gulf. But they, they, I mean, that doesn't quite fit the message very well. But they said, you know, they had those great all of the above messages. We're for this and for this and for this. And you see the windmills in the background and the music is beautiful. And you think, wow, these guys are really good people. They want, they want good stuff to happen to the Gulf, you know? Um, and no one really knows that their idea of all of the above is actually everything from, from regular to premium. You know, and you know, there's, a, there's that 1% you know, of alternative fuels um, that is largely aimed at quashing it. But that's another whole story. Um, but you test it against strong opposition language. If you can beat that, that's when you can speak to legislators. Because that's when you can say to someone, you know what? You use this language. I promise you, in your district, you will win with it. And that's when you, that's when you change the hearts and minds of legislators. Um, I'm going to just give you some examples. These are, these are um, I test messages, which are sort of narratives that can be expanded or contracted like an accordion, where you could turn them into a speech, or you can just insert them into an op-ed. Uh, but they get up, they, 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 they basically get an entire idea across, but they do it in about 45 to 60 seconds. Or, like if you're ever on hardball with Chris Matthews, you've got about six seconds before Chris's ADD kicks in, and, you know, he cuts you off. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm being, I'm being mean. I really like Chris Matthews. But, but he doesn't give you a lot of time to say what you want to say. Uh, so here are some examples of messages that I can tell you. Every one of these beats the toughest all of the above message uh, by 30 to 60 points. Our greatest natural resource is American ingenuity. You begin an energy message with that, an alternative energy message with that, you're off to the races because that appeals to everybody uh, right, left, and center. Americans have led every technolo technological revolution of the last century. Are we really going to leave this one to China, Brazil, and Germany? You see how this gets to people's emotions? It gets to their values. One of the key things that I learned in messaging is never, use, never think about environmental messages as having to all be about, about the environment. They can be about, about American exceptionalism which this one is about. They can be about people imagining the future of America, about the past of America, what's the promise of America, what have we done? Innovation is a word that's often much more, much more often used by the right. It's much more often used by people who are not, who are anti-environmentalists. Well, people who are pro-environmentalists ought to be talking about innovation all the time. It appeals, it appeals to business people in a way that other words don't appeal. It's time to invest in clean, safe sources of energy like wind and solar so we can start sending American dollars to middle America, not to the Middle East. Speaks to national security, which energy is certainly a national security issue. We can drill our way all the way to China, but all we'll see when we get there are wind turbines. This is one of our most effective messages because it includes a little bit of humor, but it gets the point across. The Chinese are in fact building wind turbines by the thousands, and they are just outproducing us. And we're going to we're going to essentially be buying more and more wind turbines from the from the Chinese. Why aren't we building them here in America? Why don't they have a Made in America stamp on them? And that's a way to talk about it that makes all the difference. Um, if you have to burn it, it isn't clean. 
people get that immediately. When you use a tobacco metaphor, tobacco example, people get it. Here's a, here's a new, actual, I'll show you a message like that in a minute. Freedom, independence, and self-sufficiency are at the heart of who we are as a nation, and they should be at the heart of our strategy for energy independence in the 21st century. Look how we've used freedom, independence, self-sufficiency, typically words used by people by heritage in Cato and the American Enterprise Institute, but now they're supporting a progressive energy message. Finally, the clean, safe fuels of the 21st century or the dirty, dirty, unsafe fuels of the 19th. It's our choice. This one makes it about as clear as you can make it. Now, here's, a, here's an example of, of, of a narrative that, that beats anything the other side can say by energy, uh, for alternative energy, by 40 points or more. This is work done for the NRDC. The best way to bring jobs and prosperity back to this country is also the best way to end our dependence on foreign oil and protect the earth we leave our children. To build things in America again, starting with wind turbines, solar panels, and energy efficient products that say, made in America. We have led every technological revolution of the last two centuries. Electricity, the railroads, the telephone, automobiles, the television, computers. There's no reason we can't lead this one. The sun, the wind, and the geothermal energy at the core of the earth provide a limitless supply of clean energy, and our scientists can harness them, and our workers can build them. We've always been leaders, not followers, and it's time to harness the greatest sources of power we have in this country, American ingenuity. Now, you look at that message, and it touches upon probably eight different values that are core to Americans across the political spectrum. Look at it from the start. Jobs and prosperity. Americans want jobs more than anything else right now, and they want good ones. Dependence on foreign oil. National security. Protect the earth we leave our children. Children. By the way, environmental issues are one of the few issues on which uh, women are not more progressive than men. And part of the reason is because we don't use words like the earth we leave our children. Um, build things in America again. American exceptionalism, as well as people's concerns about their children having jobs someday, and themselves having jobs. Our American leadership, a key, key point in this, the sun, the wind, and the geothermal energy at the core of the earth. Never say geothermal energy without explaining what it is. People don't know what it is. But if you say the geothermal energy at the hot core of the earth, people go, oh, there's all that heat in there. We could be using that, couldn't we? Now they get it. But it's explaining it in context. You don't ever have to say what I mean by geothermal. You don't do it. You just do it in context. You do it enough times, and by repetition, people understand geothermal. But never use geothermal by itself. Um, here, I'm actually going to skip over this one and show you one about climate change. This is one that deactivates ambivalence. In, in this one, by the way, wins by over 40 points over the toughest climate denier message you can develop. And this was done three, four years ago. I'm about to have an opportunity to update these messages now. Local temperatures always fluctuate naturally. Now, I learned about this by, by this is a case where focus groups are really useful. I did focus groups with men, and this was with my, with my colleague, Celinda Lake. And I watched men's nonverbals when I gave them a message that started something like this. And men started out hostile, by and large, to climate change. But as soon as you say, local temperatures always fluctuate naturally, suddenly their shoulders went down. And it was like, oh, this is somebody I can listen to. This is not one of those climate nuts. That's what they're thinking. But you've just, essentially, you've turned off that network, that climate nut, Al Gore network, which, again, nothing against Al Gore. The man's been right on everything he said. He's right about the Iraq war. He was one of about three people who had the guts to say it. He was pilloried by the media for it. But he was right. And he was right about climate change. He was right about it a long time ago. We just didn't ever figure out how to talk about it well until an inconvenient truth. But local temperatures always fluctuate naturally. But when the hottest 10 years on record have all occurred since 1990, we have a problem. That is a killer fact. Uh, it's a term that I discovered. I was using the term and discovered when I was at a, at a conference in um, a small conference in, in Europe. Uh, Tony Blair's uh, political team, he'd go to them and on any issue and he'd say, bring me some killer facts. And what he was talking about is these facts that make your head spin around. This is one that makes people's heads spin around. 
really? Hottest 10 years in history, recorded history have all been the last, the last uh, 20 years? That's, um, that's pretty scary. Well, that should be scary. It goes on to say, we also have a problem when the American Lung Association reports that, that toxic chemicals in the air we breathe are affecting the health of nearly half of all Americans. What we've just done is to connect two issues that were unconnected in people's minds. Now, why is this important? Is because lungs, if you say the, the air we breathe and then move to climate, in this case, we did it the reverse because we had a killer fact. Normally, you want to say, you want to get people to picture soot going into your lungs. Where do you think it goes after that? It goes up into the atmosphere. Then people get it. It's like, it's like secondhand smoke for the, for the Earth's atmosphere. But if you don't first, if you don't introduce lungs, they're much, much less likely to get it. It goes on to say, if we, it's time we protect our atmosphere end our reliance on foreign energy and recharge our economy by developing a clean, safe energy economy for the 21st century. It means investing in energy from sources that never run out. By the way, that's a way of saying, um, saying words like sustainable or, or renewable that don't, don't require people to understand what those terms mean. If you're going to say renewable sources of energy, always say renewable sources of energy like the wind and the sun that never runs out. Again, it's like geothermal from the co hot core of the earth. It explains it in context. It goes on, like the sun and the wind, using technologies that will create millions of jobs now. It means set, setting tough pollution standards for coal and industrial plants that damage our atmosphere, making them pay if they fail to meet those standards, and rewarding good corporate citizens that exceed them. I did not just say cap and trade. You say cap and trade, and your message plummets. People hate it. They don't know what it is, but they hate it. I just described cap and trade. That's what it is. Rewarding good corporate citizens and punishing those who aren't good corporate citizens. Making them pay for it. They want to pollute. It's cap and trade. It goes on. It means setting higher fuel standards for automobiles, and it means giving families and small businesses. By the way, we should be talking about small businesses all the time, environmental messages. Uh, uh, a dollar back on their taxes for every dollar they spend on cars, appliance and appliances, and renovations to their homes and buildings that conserve energy. That message, again, there's nothing that can beat that from the other side. Uh, I'm going to skip over this one, other than just to show you the very first two sentences. My family's health matters to me. When I showed this to my client, they looked at me like I was nuts. This is a climate change message, right? My family's health matters to me. And I'm concerned about the pollution released every day into our air, soil, and rivers. Why, was this, why did I develop a message that started this way? I developed it because I knew that statistic about women, that women tend not to be leading the way on this issue the way they lead the way on every other progressive issue. They tend to be equal to men or slightly behind them on support on climate change, for example. Um, it goes on. It seems like every month I learn about another family member, friend, or coworker with some new form of cancer. Just look at the smoke smokestacks and waste dumps and coal plants and oil refineries, the rivers we used to swim or fish in with our grandparents and the emission from our cars. We can't afford to keep pouring millions of tons of waste every day into the air. And now it starts moving into, it's time we start moving away from the dirty fuels of the past and lead the world in the development of the safe new energy technologies of the future they rely on natural fuels that you don't have to burn, like wind and solar energy. And you can see we've just segued from a health message into a climate change message. And this message, again, wins by 40 points over anything you can throw at it. So let me just wrap up. Um, two more, do I have time for two more slides? Can you tolerate it? Is that a yes or a no? OK, we'll do them fast. Instead of renewables, try this, energy that will never run out like the wind and the sun, carbon emissions, greenhouse gases, global warming, CO2 emissions, people have no idea what you're talking about. They do know what, what you mean when you say pollution that destroys our lungs and atmosphere. But always say lungs first. If you say lung, pollution that destroys our lungs and atmosphere, the dials go up. If you say pollution that destroys our atmosphere and lungs, the dials go down. It's because they first have to, see, have to understand something they do understand, which is pollution destroys our lungs. 
then they can picture it going up into the atmosphere. That's the, an example of where being a neuroscientist is actually helpful because I can think about, and having done 25 years of clinical work with, with, as a psychotherapist was really helpful. Because there what you're trying to do is you're trying to thread the needle of people's ambivalence to speak inconvenient truths. And you have to do it by starting with an analogy they understand and then moving to the thing that they're having trouble with. Um, the environment, blandest term you could pro possibly use. Try instead the air we breathe and the water we drink, or the water our children drink. The majesty of our land. Wilderness areas where families have hiked, fished, and hunted for generations. There's a great message for Southerners. Because now you're adding in hunting, and now you're bringing hunters, hunters on board. Because you know what? Hunters don't like polluted areas either. Uh, nor, to, nor to people who, nor to anglers. So why not, why not bring those people in with us, just like we bring in uh, we can bring in evangelical Christians with mes messages about stewardship of the earth. Here's one that I'll stop, I'll, actually I'll stop with two more. Barrels of oil. Never talk about barrels of oil. No one knows what a barrel is. Can any of you pick, I mean you can picture a big barrel, I'm thinking of a pirate ship. When you say there were 200 million gallons of oil poured into the, poured into the gulf by, the, by that BP gusher. Well. I can picture 200 gallons because I fill my gas tank and I would take a, 200 million gallons. That's a lot of oil. Barrels, I don't, I don't know what 50 million barrels really translates into. Maybe it just gets kind of absorbed. Finally, retrofit is a term we use all the time. It doesn't work very well. Dials go slightly down when you use it. If you can stay in, say instead, renovate, refit, retool, insulate. Replace with appliances that save energy, people get it. I'll wrap up with this. A limit to the best of, best of messages is the green economy in Washington. You heard, heard about that this morning, so I'm not going to go over what Josh Silver talked with you about, other than to say that this. The cost of an average Senate seat is $10 million. Elizabeth Warren actually had to spend $42 million uh, against Scott Brown, and that was in Massachusetts. I think it was money well spent myself, but that's another story. <laughs> Corruption is in the eye of the beholden, as you've already seen. Why has no major player been prosecuted on Wall Street? How did corrupt banks that cost trillions in wealth to the average American get bailed out, but the working people whose homes they foreclosed didn't? Why didn't we have a plan like a, like a student loan plan that basically says to homeowners, we're going to give you, you didn't cause this problem. Uh, this was caused by bankers in New York. This is caused by bankers around the world. What we're going to do is we're going to give you a program that for a couple of years is going to help you at no interest temporarily pay for your mortgage. And that way we will not have toxic mortgages that have been, that have been bundled together because now we'll have mortgages that are getting paid and they'll be backed up by exactly the same amount of money that we've used to back up the bankers. But instead, we let 10% of Florida parents have to tell their parents, tell their kids, sweetie, this isn't your room anymore. It's criminal, but it wasn't. No one's been prosecuted. And interestingly, uh, that was true under both the Republican administration, the Bush administration, and the Obama administration. No one's been punished for what they did, except Madoff, who had nothing to do with any of this stuff. He was just making off with his own stuff. Uh, uh, in comparison, Ronald Reagan, not typically known as a, as a, uh, as a tough guy on white-collar crime and as a tough guy on, on uh, business people who caused people misfortune, uh, when there was a, uh, the savings and loan scandal, there were thousands of bankers who Ed Meese put behind, behind bars, his, his, uh, his um, uh, attorney general. Why are we giving six billion in tax breaks to oil companies? We'll talk about entitlement, cuts to entitlement programs for middle class. Why did GE pay no taxes last year, despite $14 billion in taxes? People forget that the tax rates are down two thirds since Dwight D. Eisenhower, a Republican. Uh, why don't we have tax brackets at 1 million, 10 million, and 1 billion? Why doesn't the Senate end its faux filibuster where all you have to do, you know, it used to be you had to do what Jimmy Stewart did, you know, in, in, uh, in um, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. You know, you had to stand up there with a phone book or you had to say, gee, guys, what, what, we just can't keep doing this anymore. We've got to change the way we work here in the Senate. I mean, you don't have to do that anymore. All you have to do is... I filibuster, and it's done. We don't have filibuster reform because too many people are getting paid off. That's why. Um, 
So conclusion, sustainable language. Times of crisis are times of opportunity. The opportunity right now is that people can see extreme weather with their own eyes. And I believe that's going to give us our first chance of really making a dent with messaging on climate change in particular uh, um, right now. And I think now is the time to move on. This is a time of crisis. We need to speak in everyday language to people's values, their concerns, and their aspirations for themselves and their kids and their grandkids. We need to leave people with hope so that they feel like there's actually something we could do about it. The best science will get us nowhere if the language that we use is not sustainable. And that means used by everyday people and policymakers alike. If the language that you develop doesn't get used around the kitchen table, it is not language that's good language. So when people started saying death panels, that stuck. And I remember my Democratic friends saying, oh, isn't that stupid? And I said, no, it's not. That's going to stick. And the reason that's going to stick was because people understood that if government got more involved in healthcare decisions, there were going to have to be blue ribbon panels that determined, well, what happens when an 85-year-old guy has a liver problem? Is that where we invest our money? Do we invest our money in a, in a, in a, you know, in a very, very premature baby who's going to have all kinds of problems in life? Well, those are going to be questions that are going to be raised. That's what death panels did, and it scared the hell out of senior citizens. There was a, an easy answer, which is we already have death panels. They're called insurance companies, but wasn't used. The best science will, ne will get us nowhere if the only thing that leads to sustainable political campaigns is sustainable campaign money. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you very much for listening for so long.